I've attained a black belt. I was nervous. I, I was thinking, I, I've got to live up to this. I've got to go to class and do this as justice, you know? Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 768. My guest today is Mr. Scott Robertson. If you're new, you might not know my name or voice. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. Are you a traditional martial artist? Have you been to whistlekick.com lately? If not, I would encourage you to start there. It's our online home. Everything from our store to our other projects, all the things that we do as an organization are linked or available right there. Now, you can catch the link over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com from there, or you can just go direct. That's where we put everything about our episodes, because there's more than just the audio or the occasional video. We have show notes with transcripts, which are really easy to search through if you're trying to find a section of an episode. We also include photos and links, sometimes videos that the guests contribute or things that we reference in an episode. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for that. You can sign up for our newsletter while you're over there. You could also throw us a couple bucks as a tip if that's your way of showing that you value what we do. All that we do is under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists worldwide. And we do a lot of things to further that mission. And if you do see value in our mission, well, you could purchase something at whistlekick.com with the code podcast15, throw us a tip via PayPal, you could buy a book or join our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. I want to thank everybody who contributes to the Patreon. You know who you are. I'm not going to name you. But when I look at the numbers, it is incredibly rare that people leave or reduce their contribution. In fact, it's the exact opposite. People stick around forever and increase their contributions because we are all about value here. If you want to see all the things going on with our Patreon and why it's such a great value and why people stick around, go to patreon.com slash whistlekick. Check it out. And if you consider yourself part of the Whistlekick family, you should be checking out the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. We give you behind the scenes stuff as well as all the ways you can help us in our mission, the way you can be part of it. And uh, well, it's free. Today's guest, like most of our guests, talks about taking their martial arts skills outside and taking the outside back into martial arts. Today's guest has something in common with Andrew as a drummer, and that's how we ended up with him for the show. This is someone that Andrew knows, and I had a great time talking to Scott. We talked about starting martial arts a little bit later than most people do and what that meant, as well as so many other things. So instead of me trying to sum it up here, I'll just leave you to the conversation. Scott, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thrilled to be here. Yeah, I appreciate having you here. We were chatting just a little bit, you know, audience. As you know, you don't get to see and hear everything as the audience. Um, But one of the things, Scott, that you you mentioned, and it was in in the bio you sent over. And so I want to start here, because I suspect there's a good story, was the age at which you started. Because yes. you're, you, you kind of underscored it a little bit just in the way you presented it. So tell everybody when you started and why. Okay. Well, I started martial arts in 1996 at the age of 38 years old, which is later. A few than years ago. I like to start. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, sorry, I'm just, I've, I'm in my drum studio here. Yeah, it's okay. And my snares are rattling and they're, I'm just gonna. I, I did. I didn't even hear it, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah you know. You know. Andrew is a a, a drummer. Well, I've I met assume you. Before. We were at uh, we were at a, a school called Piping Hot. In okay. East. Okay. I th- I thought that was the connection. Okay. That's so you know we're... that that just co- as a as an organization, uh, we love we love drummers. We kind of have to. <laughs> so, please continue. So anyway, so I was 38 years old, and I I started. Uh, taekwondo at a school um, and well geez why I, I mean there's a, a myriad of reasons um, I was partly encouraged by my wife because our nephews were going to the school mm. and we got word that he had an, a, a daytime adult class mm-hmm. and so uh, 
I was, uh, I was, you know, I, nobody had ever accused me of being an athlete before this time. And, uh, and, and uh, I was going to the gym, but not really making a lot of progress. And so I, I went out to this club and to, to try a day class and I met some of the friendliest people you would ever want to mm-hmm. come across. They made me feel very welcome. And uh, so I started training there and uh, I've been to four different schools in my time. Uh, the lion's share of it was at a place called Pacific Coast Taekwondo run by Grandmaster Daniel Witt. And I stayed there from 2000 to, uh, to 2020 uh, when, when COVID hit and it, it, the owner decided to retire at that point rather than keep everything on hold for a couple of years. But he had run the school very successfully for well over, well over 30 years. Hmm. Uh, all the other schools that I went to lasted a few years and closed as most martial arts schools do. It does tend to happen. What was it you found early on, right? Because people start things all the time. And you saw that, I'm sure, in the schools you were at. People started, they came in, they tried it, but they didn't all stick around. And they certainly didn't stick around for decades. What was it you found in training that kept you? Um, there was a few things that appealed to me. Um, for one thing, as I said, I was more encouraged to go to the gym and get on the treadmill and do a few weights and stuff like that because I wanted to be in better shape for class, right? And so I was stretching more at home and, and doing some of the things that you, you need to do. Um, so it encouraged me to, to, to keep working. But I have to say, one of the things that really appealed to me right off the bat was the formalities. Yeah. The uh, I, there was just something very appealing to me that that, that they're, you're buying into a hierarchy, and this this process when you come into the school, you salute the flag, you say hello to the instructor. Um, there's a hierarchy of, of of ranks. There's people that you're on first name basis with. Uh, instructors are Mister or Ms. Anybody fourth dan or higher is master. And there was something about the formalities of that that, that really appealed to me. Mm. Uh, it, it, I guess we have so little of that now, you know, in our jobs and that everybody's on a first name basis. There was, there was just something that really, really hit home with me on, on the formalities. And I just frankly liked the physical results I was getting. I was nervous mm-hmm. about going in because I wasn't in great shape, but uh you know, you, you start working out and, and you just do what you can to start with and you slowly build yourself up. And I like the results I was getting. Mm. You said that you stopped in and the people were really friendly. What, what did that look like? Because I, I think a lot of people, they think of hierarchy and formality as a, uh, as a barrier. Now, of course, I know as someone who's trained a long time, you know, because you were part of it. Most of our audience knows that it doesn't have to be. It can actually give people some space to feel comfortable what was it about their friendliness that or 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 how i I guess a better question how did that friendliness show up well i think it was the fact that people when they see a beginner come in i guess they partly see some of themselves and they go oh yeah i know how that feels to walk in first day and not know anything and and it was the fact that uh Everybody there wants everybody else to do well. Uh, that hit that hit me. Uh, uh, people who have uh, who who've gotten their first dan and or their first black belt, they want everybody to reach that, and they want to do everything they can to help you get there. And so that was what struck me. Mm. Um, it was just that it was that willingness of of people to share what they knew, even if they were only green belt they wanted they wanted you to get to green belt they want they wanted to share what got them there with me and uh i just again it it, it really struck home with me it made me want to keep coming back you were nervous your first classes we all were i assume you were probably somewhat sold after that first class maybe not fully sold or, was, or were you or was that was that it it was oh it took one class i i was i was sold i just really liked it right off the bat i liked the workout i just uh right off the right from the get-go i liked it mm. 
And you said you went with some encouragement from your wife. Do you remember the conversation that evening when, when you went home? I'm assuming you talked to her about it. Well, she just said to me that uh, that her nephews were in this Taekwondo class, which I which I knew. And, uh, and she said, you know, he's got an adult daytime class. You know, you've always said you've liked martial arts stuff on, on you know, watching martial arts and, and, and the movies and all that. Why don't you just go give it a try? And that's what I did. That's what the conversation was. Mm -hmm. I said, sure. I and, and how did it go from there? Well, it, for, for me, it was, it was, it was great. I mean, um, I mean, like everybody, I had my struggles. Um, when you're starting, when you're approaching your 40th birthday, you, you, you have to be realistic about, about what you can do and who you can keep up with. And, but, uh, the, the first instructor I had, he just he just ran a, a good adult class. He he had us doing stuff that was all within our abilities. He was very encouraging, you know. Uh, but again, the school, as many of them do, started to wane. And then I, I went to the next one. And many of the people, the adults from that school, we, we kind of went en masse to the next school that was willing to run a day class for adults. Wow. And uh, the instructors were just uh, very encouraging. And uh, adults, students, as with my adults, drum students tend to be very hard on themselves. And they were just very good at saying, relax, you know, you're going to do fine. Just, you just need to do this a thousand times. You know, you've got to do it <laughs> a thousand times. It's, it's not going to come overnight, you know? Yeah. You talked a little bit about the changes that happened. And a lot of these are changes that we might expect. But anytime you have a change that takes some time to surface, we, we it sneaks up on us. And we go, oh, w did you have any moments like that? You know, uh, oh, clothes fitting differently or playing with with younger kids and going, oh, I'm, I'm keeping up with them better. Was it was there something like that that made you connect the dots and say, this really is working? Oh, yeah. Well, all of those things. Yes. Yes to all of those things. Um, uh, one of the things that, that doing the training really encouraged me to do was keep my cardio going. You know, so when I'm running a group of kids around the dojang, that I could keep up with them and 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 do as many laps as them. And as an instructor, you know, rather than sitting on the side and barking out what I want them to do, like it, it was encouraging that I could I could still do the laps and that for you know quite some time. Mm. That's great. Um, I think one of the things that that is probably a common story uh, uh, that, that was with me. Uh, one of my most encouraging moments is when I got what was called a yellow stripe. You, in Taekwondo, your first step after white belt is to get a yellow stripe on your belt. And that was that was really that was really encouraging for me. You know, you're saying, hey, I've been at this long enough that I've I've got a mark for it, you know, mm -hmm. and then when you get your, your, your yellow belt, you, you really feel, uh, you, you feel like you're going somewhere with this, you know, yeah. as adults, we don't have a lot of that recognition. You know, it's something that we see in, in kids, you know, they move up in grades and, uh, we celebrate their birthdays with big parties and yeah. martial arts or, or other activities that they have. We, we often denote that progress, but yeah, as adults, we don't, frequently have that and it still feels good we, we like to be able to recognize that we're getting better yeah well i think for for me when when i started out the first people you that i was really looking at were the yellow belts because that's the first belt rank after white and and that seems to be your most uh, immediate achievable goal you know, you look at the blue belts and the red belts, and you think, "Oh, geez, geez that's it's it's like difficult to even imagine yourself there, isn't it?" It, it really is. It really, really is. And um, you know, when our, when our instructor said to us in class one day, he says, "You know, I look at all you guys. You guys are all going to get the black belt." I, I had a little bit of rejection I had when he said that. You know, and. Uh, but I think everybody has that at first, you know, you're in a long line in your class and the people who are the closest to you 
that are above you are the are the yellow belts and you see that as an achievable goal so getting your first yellow stripe and your first yellow belt even as an adult that's quite meaningful it really it, it really gives you feedback that you've that you've been at this long enough you've learned to do stuff you've kept up with some people and it felt great and it makes you want to hang in there for the green one yeah martial arts has and, and traditional taekwondo has so many different elements to it there, there's sparring and there's forms and there's often breaking and self-defense and basics did you find yourself gravitating to or away from any of those specific elements uh, yes i i really enjoyed doing forms oh. um we would always use uh forms as a warm-up so you would go in and do forms and just do them softly and just it would just get uh, a nice dynamic stretch working, get some some fluid into your joints. And I would find even if I was going out to uh, outside to a trail for a run, if I just do a few forms first, I'd just feel a little bit better loosened up for the run. And uh, so so yes, I I'd have to say one of my favorite parts was forms. Mm. It often changes as people progress and learn new forms. But what was your first favorite form? Oh, you know, I, I I'm That's sorry, okay. I don't have an answer for that. That's okay. I, I just I liked doing them all. I did, really. Uh, um, with Taekwondo, there, there's a few different branches of Taekwondo, sure. and the the first Taekwondo school I did. The first two schools uh, I went to, we did what was called the ITF forms. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to Pacific Coast Taekwondo, we did the uh, Kukiwan forms, which is a, a mm -hmm. different set. And mm -hmm. when I went to a Kung Fu school, we did some Kung Fu forms. So so uh, uh, I just enjoyed doing them all. It was a, I, I got a nice rounded experience of mm -hmm. doing them all in a couple of different styles. The Kung Fu school, the, the, those forms were obviously, they were um, quite different. They were, sure. I guess I would just describe them as more circular. Lots of, yep. lots of big circular motions and uh, Taekwondo, lots of, you know. Rigid. Right, straight line. Yeah. Yeah. Was it difficult going from the ITF to the, the Kukiwan or the WTF, WT forms? Um, no, there was just differences to learn. Yeah, there was just there was just a few. This had a different way of going about it, you know. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, it was there was a transition. I've known a few people who've gone actually different directions on that exchange, and and uh, for some of them, they have that sort of approach. Yeah, you know, it's all the same. It's just a little different. And others, oof. You you would you would think we were asking them to to swap their feet, literally to put you know, put yes. their feet on a different leg. Yeah. <sighs> what else were you finding in your in your? I don't mean early in terms of the first couple of weeks, but when someone does something for decades, early is the first few years. What else were you finding in your first few years of training? You were enjoying forms. Martial arts was certainly benefiting you, and what else? Well, it really uh, had an impact on the way that I do my job, which say more about that. Good, good, good chunk of what I do for a living is teaching drum lessons. You can see I've got two drum sets beside me, my home studio, but I've, I've taught, I teach drum corps as, as does Andrew. Um, and it, it really affected the way I approached a lot of things in my job. So for teaching, so uh, when you come for drum lessons, there's there's just this ongoing process. Of, we did that last week, and this week we're going to build on it a little bit and keep mm -hmm. moving. But what was really missing, you know, was what we have in martial arts is, well, I don't give belts, but there should be recognition along the way. You've done this much work. You can do, you've accumulated this much skill. Here's a mm -hmm. certificate for this level. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that until I I I did martial arts. So it, it really impacted me to bring in that sort of level standard. What the, uh, was the result of that for 
the students you were teaching? Well, I, I think it just it gave them some feedback between, mm. you know, for them to share with their parents is this is where this is where we've been and and the next level. This is this is where we're going to be going with this, you know. Um, martial arts. Uh, being a student in martial arts gave me a new, a new. Well, not. A, I'm trying to say this the right way. I'm sorry if okay. I'm stumbling a no, little. No, that's all right. Take your time. Um, a per, just a perspective, a better perspective of the student's point of view. When you start to do things like teach drum lessons, you're 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 in your own world. You, you you're in something that you've been very dedicated to, and you've put a lot of time in, and you're a lot of, and you're very passionate about, and and you have to remember what it's what it's like to to be a student to struggle with something that maybe seems very plain and very obvious to the teacher, you know. And going into uh, uh, a dojong and training and just not getting the hang of something, and you have a very patient teacher trying to guide you through this frustration. You have to remember later that day when you go to teach your lessons, you know, be patient with your student. They're struggling with some of these things that I may find very, very obvious. It's not obvious to them, you know, because it wasn't obvious to me today. And, and and that sort of thing affected the, the way I, I approach. I've long said that I think every martial arts instructor would benefit from being a student, at least periodically, to remember exactly what you're talking about. This idea that, you know, thing, remember, there are kids, some kids just plain can't stand up sometimes. They just fall over for seemingly no reason to us. But, you know, things are still kind of figured out how they work in their body. I, I've had the conversation with my instructor many times. It, it's, it's odd how we have to work so hard to do that, which is a natural motion. Hmm. You know, it wouldn't be uncommon for, well, if you have a kid standing left foot forward, right? And you say, take one step forward for them to take that forward foot and sort of. Yeah. No, just step forward. It, 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 there's something about receiving verbal instructions and trying to process that verbal instruction into an action that, that's really quite challenging. Well, we, we forget often that the brain isn't fully formed until sometime around 25. Right. And, you know, you get someone who's six, seven, eight years old, they may have tremendous athletic ability, but it doesn't mean that that ability necessarily comes from... Uh, instruction they're just they're running and jumping and doing things kind of instinctively but now run over there and jump on that and then spin here and do this and it can be too much and they start by stopping and going what yeah yep. what do you want me to do and then on the flip side that there's kids that come in and they're just uh they're just very athletic from day one. The, the the pennies just drop for them right away, and they do some amazing stuff. And, yeah. You know, you, if you're instructing, you deal with them all. You got to do it patiently and encouragingly. And as I said, all that stuff fed into the way I teach drums. And uh, and conversely, when I started to become uh, an instructor at my at, at Pacific Coast, a lot of my uh, skills that I had developed teaching drum corps and teaching private drum lessons, I was able to bring into the dojo. Hmm. Where were you in your journey when you started teaching? Well, I was at Pacific Coast Taekwondo. I think um, at at the time, I, I think I might have been a second Dan when I started uh, doing some classes and helping oh, wow. out in the school that I was at. Uh, Grandmaster Witt had a had a process for instructors. First, you became a prospect. Um, then you spent a little bit of time assisting as a as a tutor. Then you would become an assistant instructor and then an instructor. Mm. And uh, and if you reach fourth dan, you were called master instructor. Was and this something you wanted to do, or something you were told you were going to do? Oh no, I wanted to. It it's it. 
as I said, I found it quite common among martial artists that that people in martial arts tend to want to share what they've learned with other people. Yeah. Just seems to be a characteristic. People are usually anxious to do it. I certainly was, and but I had a lot of um, I had a lot of experience uh, with drum corps teaching, teaching, mm. and running drum corps, and teaching workshops as a as a drum corps leader. To, to bring in front of a class, it's just different subject matter, but a lot of the dynamics are the same, you know? Yeah. Let's take a little bit of a detour because I think it would help us understand you and and these things that we're talking about. How'd you get into drumming? Oh, well, I started in, in pipe bands just, uh, well, I'm not sure if Andrew started in pipe band, but uh, I started at 10 years old. Okay. I, I, joined, uh, I joined a local pipe band called the White Spot Pipe Band. White Spot was a chain of restaurants that s- sponsored the band at the time. Okay. Um, and, and was this uh, of your own interest or parental encouragement? Uh, both. My parents asked me if I wanted to join the pipe band, and I had wanted to be a drummer since I was mm. three years old. So I was just, I just flipped at the opportunity. I just thought it was awesome. And I'd, I, I, I was in a, a marching pipe band for, for well, I'm still involved with it to this very day as an instructor, uh, but I, I played strictly pipe band until I was 20 years old. Then I signed up for a jazz and commercial music program at a local college, and uh, and it's slowly over the years it became my career, you know. And it was just uh, especially from the pipe band and drum corps world, I just found a lot of parallels, where I find that uh, uh, drum corps and and martial arts is just a very good marriage. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are, you know, we we certainly don't have a, a scientific selection process. We're not trying to conduct any studies here. But there are a few different hobbies, uh, career paths that tend to show up on this show quite often. We've had quite a few musicians and not professional musicians as you and Andrew are, but a lot of people who appreciate music and and play, they do a little bit more than dabble. Maybe they were in a band or something. Uh, the other one for, for folks listening or, or yourself, if you're interested, we've had a lot of folks on the show who are involved in IT, computer technology. Uh, and I see a lot of synergy between the two, Mar- martial arts and IT. There's a lot of problem solving and music and martial arts there's there's a cadence there's a there's a timing that if you can see it the whole world seems to open up for you uh, did you find that your background with music made any of the experiences perhaps with sparring or something easier Uh, the most, the main thing that was easier for me was was when I started to help out instructing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, th- there were a couple of things that I was able to take from drumming into into my practice uh, time. That, now, now that I now that you mention it, um, one of the things we do as drummers is we do combinations of rights and left hands, right? Mm. Go right, left, right, left, right, left. Then you try right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. Then you try right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. And you go through all these different permutations of these these stickings, right? Mm. And so in when I started practicing blocks, I just went in horse riding stance in front of the mirror. And I thought, okay, well, left hand down block, right hand down block, right? Body block, body block, face block, face block. And then started thinking, well, how many combinations can I do of that? You know, mm. down, body, body block, high block on the left, high block, body block, low block on the right to make kind of a circle. Now do it in reverse. Now go right, left, right, left, right, left. Just started thinking of, of what, what the drummer would, what a drummer would call the George Lawrence Stone stick control book. Mm. Um, I, I started thinking, well, how could I practice my blocks that way? And so that came in handy, but for yeah. the but for the most part, most of what I was able to take from from my drum world to to martial arts was was in coaching and and, and, sure. and teaching and helping out kids. Yeah. Sure, there there was a moment just there where you you know 
block, block, block. And then I, I really wanted to add the two punches for keep on one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things that someone who's been training a long time will often say, and it changes, it goes from, this is something I do to people use slightly different words, but it, it all means this is something that is part of me. Where were you along your path when you recognized this was no longer something you simply showed up to do a few hours a week? I would, um, I would, I would definitely, well, boy, that's a, again, that's another tough one. I definitely felt that way when I was at Pacific Coast Type One, though. Um, and, and after my first, first Dan, okay. you know, cause I see so many people, well, so many people quit before they get to first Dan. Yeah. In fact, statistically it's probably about 95%. Um, and then, well, I, I could actually back that up with records from the school, but I, mm. I don't know Andy, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's. I, I would say I would say ninety five percent people don't don't get it to first Dan, and then there's a large chunk of people that would seem to stop after first Dan. It's it's they almost treated it like a like a finishing line, you know. Yep. And uh, yeah, we talk about that on this show quite a bit. And it, it's unfortunate. It's like uh, as we would describe, it's like getting your driver's license and then deciding never to drive. Right. It's, and I'm, I'm sure you've had this conversation many times. Is it really your first Dan is where you really start to learn what's going on? In, in most schools, yeah. It's, you, you, you've got a good handle on the basics at that point. And it's. So I guess the answer to your question then is, is when did this be a little bit more than just something I do a couple of nights a week? I would, I would say for me, it was probably after my first Dan when I realized I wanted to keep going, you know, and mm. I, didn't, I didn't want to treat this as a, as a, a goal accomplished and, and, and take it home as a trophy and then never do it again. You know, mm. I, um, okay. I, I just, I knew I was in it for the long haul after that. Uh, All right. You, you talked, you know, we talked a short time ago this um wondering of how you might ever progress you know that 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 yellow stripe yellow belt was was something you could perceive attaining and, and started to attain and when you earned your first on because that that's an experience that a good chunk of this audience has had certainly not everybody or even close to everyone but it's a profound experience in almost every case. You strike me as someone who is is reflective. So I'm wondering, were there were there inner conversations about? Oh, I, I didn't I didn't actually think I would be able to do this, and I just did this. Anything like that? Very much so. Very much so. I just I was well. First thing that happened, I was at my previous school. I got what you would call a a club black belt, but then I got my first dan at, at uh, a year later at Pacific Coast Taekwondo. And, and the difference being that the the first dan is registered in a building called the Kukiwon in in Seoul, Korea. So it's <laughs> it's a recognized dan internationally. Um, so yes, I had very much had that that feeling. Um, I, I was kind of reflecting back on my my first lessons thinking the the yellow belts but I, I hope i get that far you know the green belts and the yeah you know and and so very much so reflective for me it hit me on a, a basis of now i need to live up to this you know when i go to class mm. I, again i I'm, I'm getting i know i'm being a little repetitive but i didn't want it I didn't want it to be a finishing line. Okay, I've done this now. I've, I've, 
I've, I've, I've attained, attained a black belt. I was nervous. I, I was thinking I, I've got to live up to this. I've got to go to, cl go to class and, 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 and do this, do this. It's justice, you know? Mm. And you kept going. I, I, I know from notes that I have uh, yeah. how far you progressed, but uh, talk about that, that continued progress. And obviously, you know, you you did keep showing up and you did keep progressing and learning new things and sharing and teaching and and all that and talk about that experience talk about let, let me let me frame the conversation did you ever feel like you had it figured out never not once i don't feel like that about drumming either i just I just feel like I'm this perpetual student, you know. I never, ab absolutely, never felt like I had it figured out. Every every week there was just somewhere I felt there was something needed to be better. I was uh, very privileged to be sometimes training with people who are just better martial artists than me, and they were able to point it. And again, very good at sharing their information, and they they pointed out things that, you know, I might have had. Now, nah, mostly right, but that little bit of difference that they suggested just just made all the difference in the world. Um, so, no, never felt like I I had it figured out. Um, I was actually nervous about testing higher. My my as things go, I think my instructor had a little bit more faith in me than than I had in myself. It's usually the case. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think <laughs> it is. I think it is. Um, but what was happening is I was getting um, third Dan. Well, getting older. I mean, I was mid to late forties, getting to be fifty years old. Mostly, what I was doing was, I was trying to bring things to the club. For example, uh, I ran a a black belt prep program for our students who were prepping for their first black belt test. Mm -hmm. We ran that annually for years. Um, so in in at, at Pacific Coast, what what had happened was uh, there was a there was a single black belt test a year. It was the last Saturday of May. It was called Black Belt Day, and that's where you test for your 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 black belt. And all the black belts in the school had to show up to it as well. They all had to do a demo, and you had to. Well, the idea is you just honor your rank, so that again you don't just get your rank and then get lazy you have to do your your black belt day presentation you have to do a break you have to do all your forms you have to do you know uh, your kicking demonstrations and, and all that so uh, i put together a program uh, to help kids out for that for that first big test um, i ran a micro tournament because we weren't we weren't a school that went out to tournaments or anything we we, we just ran two micro tournaments a year and uh, so I, you know, put together a, a a manual for how to run it, and and got the kids to do everything. We helped to teach kids how to referee, how to judge, and why these things are important, and how to be authoritative when you're refereeing, as well as the sparring. And so I was just I was trying to bring things to the club, and and uh, as as that happened, you know, you you accumulate rank as you keep as you keep practicing and 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 bringing these things out. Mm. So that's more where the journey went, you know, as I start, I ran a, 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 a supplemental Saturday class, all ages. Uh, we had some entire families come up, mom, dad, and the kids. Oh, wow. It was great. So um, that's where my journey started to go as, as I was getting higher in rank. I can, I can hear the joy in your voice around, you know, I, I, I feel similarly to you that I, I have nothing figured out and I am a perpetual student and, and uh, not only satisfied with that, but quite proud of it because I know I keep learning. But it sounds like there was a point in there where even, even though you knew you didn't have any, in, in I phrase it this way, so it's my words, you didn't have anything figured out you recognized on some level that you had enough figured out that you could start helping in these places where 
you recognize that some of the other students might be lacking. Yeah. And it seems like you you found that to be very rewarding. Well, well, I did. I mean, I especially the black belt prep program. I mean, I just never got sick of seeing the the look on the faces of these people getting their belts tied on them mm -hmm. for the first time. Um, we had a there was another school in uh, about a four hour drive out of Vancouver. I would call her sister school. Their instructor, uh, Master Michael Smith. Uh, both he and I were students of Grandmaster Witt, and we would go and visit his school on his black belt day. Mm. And uh, between the two schools, their black belt days being two two weeks apart, I just never got tired of seeing the face of people, young and young adults and and, and kids, getting their first their 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 first black belt tied around them. It's just, uh, and not just them; it was all their families. I mean. You know, one of the things I would say at the end of the day, all you guys look to the right a little bit. You know, I want you to look at all those proud faces. Hmm. You, you know, your whole family just got a black belt. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a, like when your local town wins a wins a championship. You don't say, you know, the team won. You say we won. Right. We won the cup. The right. whole town feels it. Right. Absolutely. That's what it's like for your family. And always one of the 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 best the best was seeing parents and their kids promoted on the same day mm. you know uh, it, it it doesn't get better than that doesn't so let's talk about the kind of the darkness there with your school closing not not an easy experience it's one that i mean i i've i've been through this both as instructor and as student uh, a lot of the people listening have been through it. It is heart wrenching. Yeah. What was yeah. that like? Well, uh, well, just not a happy, hmm. not a happy day, not happy news, but perfectly understandable. Um, you know, when the restrictions were starting to come out, I know that some schools were trying to hold their classes on Zoom and online. And uh, the owner of the school was of retirement age. And he just mm -hmm. said, he, if it's going to take two and a half years before we can, and it would have, it would have taken two and a half years. Um, he just thought it was a good time to retire. And, and uh, I suppose it would have come eventually. I mean, it, you know, we're not going to be doing this in our 90s. So uh, it just sped up. The well, some pe some yeah. people are. I'll challenge you a little bit on that. There are, plenty, there are people who do. <laughs> Not everybody, but there are people who do. I will stand corrected. I will stand corrected on that. Um, but uh, anyways, you know, it, it was not good news. I have mm. uh, not found another place to go to. I think it would be very hard for me to do, um, especially in taekwondo the, the one thing that has really changed a lot for me in the in the 20 plus years um is that a lot of a lot of it now seems very geared to smaller and younger kids yeah. uh there seemed to be uh 20 years ago there was a lot more young adults and a lot more adults in, in schools now it seems very very geared to a lot of kids classes and uh it would just be hard for me to go in uh with no other adults there and uh and uh, uh being accustomed to i'm trying to say this the right way being accustomed to going into the school and being one of the instructors and then to another school that that that's it's not the same school no it would just be hard to go in and and, and be a student uh uh with 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 a group of kids i certainly wouldn't uh if i could find a, if i found a school or i should say it this way if i find a school that is a good uh fit for a, a an adult in the 60s mm -hmm. that has a class i i wouldn't care whether it was a different martial art that would be fine but um it was it was it was just difficult news it did mm -hmm. it wasn't as we had talked about already it wasn't just something i did a couple of days a week and now the store is closed yeah. it's a big part of who i was yeah and um but we'll move on do you find yourself still 
doing your forms or as I do around my house, punching door frames and kicking plants? Uh, not too much, but when I go for a run, I still go do through, go through my forms. Mm. It's, I still find it a great way to warm up for, for anything like that. Let me, let me pose the question that, uh, I, I, I suspect there are dozens of people half screaming probably in their own head, uh, at me right now. Would you consider opening your own school? I, I don't think so because I I'm getting close to retirement age myself. I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know how far it would go. Mm. There, there are quite a few Taekwondo schools in the immediate neighborhood. Mm. Um, and uh, no, I just don't think that's in the cards for me. I had to ask. No. But I, I do, I certainly hope that you do find. I, I had asked myself that question quite a few times, actually. I, I would be shocked if you had not. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. someone with a passion and a penchant for teaching, there is. If if you're not finding an adult program that seems to make sense, clearly there's a gap in the market. Um, yeah, and and you know a lot of times we we've certainly heard this on the show. Folks will, you know, maintain some ties with people that were part of the closed up school and you know train periodically. You know, it's it, and and. And I can I can see that for both the good and the bad. It's good because it can, you know, it's something. But for a lot of folks, it it can feel almost hollow. I know what I want. I had it. Yeah. And to take less than that is sometimes much more difficult than nothing. I will say that Pacific Coast Taekwondo is a tough act to follow. Mm -hmm. the um the the chief instructor and owner uh grandmaster daniel witt was always there mm -hmm. uh, previous schools that i went to the instructor was often not there mm -hmm. sometimes the class was even being run by a blue belt or somebody mm -hmm. else you know not really good skills yeah. grandmaster witt was always there even if a if a younger student was running a class, he was still right within earshot in his office. He was always run very well. Um, I still like the fact that it was very uh, old school in the protocols. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that a lot of schools now are have, have loosened up on that a lot. Um, I guess they don't want to be unfriendly or I, I'm not really sure, but it was just very old school in our protocols yeah. and it was very, very well run, uh, managed the, and all the instructors and that were very well managed. Everybody was made sure they were doing everything in a consistent way under the, uh, supervision of, of the, the head guy hmm. that, that can be hard to find. It can. And, and I'll, I'll offer the same sort of advice that I give to a lot of people. It is usually, in my experience, easier to look for something that is quite different than what you are used to stylistically, because it makes it easier to. You're not you're not able to make as direct comparisons. Well, I know these forms, but we did them this way or, you know, right. I think you you were nodding, so I think you understand what I'm saying. I'm very, very, very much, very much. Yeah, it 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 might be just best to just try something else, something completely new. And in fact, um, what I I've been fortunate enough to start over at a variety of schools over the years to put that white belt on again, which is one of the best feelings in the world because you get to stand in the back and nobody expects anything of you. It's it's phenomenal. Well, um, my, my year or so in, in a Kung Fu kickboxing school, the instructor's name was uh, Sifu Bruce Kirby. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was already, I think I was already a, a second Dan in Taekwondo. We went there as well. Everybody starts white here, white belt here, and, and you have to work your way up. And um, and that's just how it was. And 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 he was a, a big believer that uh, 
how do I put it? He just felt that, that your rank is just rank. There are some people that come in and, and they're really good in a very short time and other people str struggle for a long time. And, and, and your rank doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're, you're better than a, a lower rank because somebody can come along that's very good, very quick. He, he, one time he, he had a, a class where he had everybody put their, their belts in a box and randomly pick out a belt and put it on for that class. You, you're mm -hmm. still who you are, you know? Uh, you don't, when you take that belt off at the end of class, it doesn't change what you know. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. If we reconnected in a few years, three years, five years, somewhere in that ballpark, and I asked you to give me an update on your life as it pertained to martial arts, what would you hope you were going to tell me? Um, well, being that I haven't been training for a couple of years, uh, what, what, what would stay with me? Uh, that's a good one. I would, I would need time to think about it, but, okay. um, uh, w one of the things is uh, I certainly liked the order of things in a in the old school martial arts, and I I would like that to stay with me. You know, mm -hmm. um, the the uh, well, this has been said before. I'm I'm probably supposed to know who said it first, but I don't. You know, martial arts isn't about focusing on what you can't do it's it's focusing on what you can do and i would like that to stay with me that, mm. that if you were to con contact me in three years and say you know what in my martial arts life is has stuck with me i would hope it would be that focus on focus on what what you can do be positive about what you can't do keep it keep working on the on your weaknesses make them better be realistic about about what you can achieve at your at your level of development all those sorts of things uh, I, I would hope that that would stick with me in sort of a, a likely a similar veined question what advice might you give to the folks listening If you're, what, what would you tell the people listening? Well, if you're just starting out in martial arts or if you haven't started yet and you're looking for a school, I would say find a good school with a well-organized program with a hands-on instructor. And I would not be so concerned about what the martial art is as I would be concerned that the school is, is run well, you know, whether it's karate, or kung fu, taekwondo, you know, go to a find find a good program with a good hands-on instructor. Um, I would say to anybody that's uh, live up to you know same as same as I say with 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 drumming, live up to your own standards. You know, um, depending on what age you are, you've got to be realistic you know uh, a 40 year old martial artist that's learning is not going to do what an 18 year old can do and that's that's just life yeah you know but be really good at what a 40 year old can do you know i want to thank scott for coming on the show and i want to thank all of you for listening i had a good time with this i am continually reminded by our guests that martial arts doesn't stop it doesn't end it's something that we have available for our growth, for our training, for whatever reasons you train, forever. And I hope we as an industry can get a little bit better about letting everyone know that martial arts is not only for children. Remember, if you like what we do and you want to support our mission to connect, educate, and entertain, you can join the Patreon. You can pick up a book. You can schedule me to come in for a seminar. You can leave a review somewhere. There's so many things that you can do. And for those of you who do them, 
I really appreciate you. For those of you who maybe haven't done anything lately or ever, please take a moment and think about why. We work hard on this stuff and we got bills to pay, man. <laughs> if you want to reach out to me directly, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. The Whistlekick social media is at Whistlekick everywhere you might imagine. That takes us to the end. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>